Hey guys, welcome back. I have Dave Dowling back again for interview number three. And uh, we've got a lot of information to cover in this video. We were just talking before we hit record about one of Steve's book, Building the Classic Physique the Natural Way. And there's a few different versions of this book. Uh, Dave has an original. He probably can see his better than mine. And I have an original here. So uh, recently somebody had gone on my YouTube community page and had talked about how building the classic physique the natural way was developed and I know you have a lot of info on this book so Dave why don't you fill us in okay well the book premiered uh when I first met Steve in 96 in Falls Church Steve was being honored at the Mr. America contest and you were actually there at that contest and and was that your first meeting with Steve yeah was the first time I met him Yes. Go ahead. And uh, it was touch and go if the books are going to be printed in time. And they were printed in time. And some of them got hurt in the rain and so on and so forth. But uh, the what happened with the book was it was uh, the main writer was John Little, who's written many, many articles on Steve. And, and he, he knew Steve he, very well. He's at the ranch many times. He did that with Bob Wolf. And George Helmer's role was actually to coordinate everything to coordinate the graphics, to coordinate the printing, and so on and so forth. But it was mainly John Little and Bob Wolf sat down with Steve, and Steve would dictate to them, and you know, John would massage the words because he's an experienced writer. So that's how it happened. And I do remember when Steve was looking at the book, he found a few errors he didn't like. He, he wasn't crazy about the cover. He thought it should have been a full body shot, and, and that's how we see it today. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, uh, and then some things here and there, here and there. and uh, But they were under the gun to get it out. So they knew it wasn't going to be perfect, but I still think it's a great book, I, whether you have the first edition or the second edition. But it was mainly John Little, Bob Wolf, and uh, Steve who brought the words together. So make no mistake, then, if you're watching, listening, this book, Building the Classic Physique, The Natural Way, went through two or three revisions and it comes directly from Steve. Steve was alive when this book came out. He was proud of the book. Obviously, uh, more information was added later on. It was expanded. The cover was changed. I remember seeing pictures of John Little and I think George in Steve's home gym. And I believe in the picture I'm thinking of, John Little is writing down while Steve is mm. demonstrating. Yes, yes. So no. you can't get more accurate than that. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they were after Steve, not, not John Little and that, and that team, but other people were after Steve to write a physique book, a training book for years, and he kept pushing it aside. And then I don't, I'm not sure who convinced him, hey, Steve, let's write one. And, they, and the, the team put it down, and, and there you have it. Yeah, but, and, you know, I have a follow-up topic here in a moment that uh you know feeds right into what you're talking about in the steve reeves interview that pat henry and tony quinn did in 98 march of 98 in mm -hmm. london uh you know tony asks steve about a training book and steve felt like nobody would be interested in it so i i'm with you i don't know who actually convinced Steve, to get it out there, I, I guess it was John Little and Bob Wolf. I bet it was John Little. I bet it was John Little. It was John Little. But it was a, a huge team effort, a huge team effort. And um, I got to do a shout out to somebody because when they came out with this version, um, you know, Steve found some problems with it. They sent a copy off to a guy, I think he lives in San Francisco still, Joseph Cavino Jr., a well-established writer. I think he's written 24 books on various topics, including fitness. Mm. And he offered his services, you know, for nothing. <laughs> and he went through the entire book and edited it for them. And he did a spectacular job, a spectacular job. He caught everything. He caught everything. So, so yeah. you say Steve knew Joseph Cavino Jr. from San Francisco? He had already known Joseph? No, no. Uh, Joseph touched base with uh, Steve's partner, Deborah. Some, okay. 
and said, uh, you know, I, I'm a writer and I, I admire Steve and I'm into his training and all this other stuff. If you ever need any help with anything. And she remembered that. So she sent a copy of the first edition off to Joseph and he went through the whole book and she really valued, they, they both valued his opinion and his changes. So yep, wonderful. Played a big part in it. And then finally, uh, from my perspective on building the classic physique, the natural way, there is a page in the book. I don't know if it's in the first revision or all of the revisions mm -hmm. of Steve's handwritten uh, schedule, as he called it. He didn't call it a routine. He liked to call it his workout schedule. Uh, I'm assuming that handwritten uh, schedule was Steve's, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you, how can anybody now deny that this building the classic physique the natural way is Steve's workout? No, so there. No. It's a <laughs> workout. And the other thing, after the first edition came out, as I remember, um, they sent out like an errata sheet, a, a page or two, to slip in the book. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was something, I can't remember the exercise that Steve was demonstrating, mm -hmm. but... Anyway, that was fixed in the second edition. So, yep. It is a fantastic book. Uh, you can maybe find it on stevereeves.com. I know normally George Helmer, that's uh, George Helmer's website. He sells pictures, posters, books. And if you want to get a copy, you can check that site uh, or eBay if you want to pay a lot of money on eBay. No, go just, <laughs> just go to George's site and save a few bucks. A lot go to George's site. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, anything else on uh, building the classic physique the natural way? That's all I got. No, uh, just I know it continues to sell well and it's well received. Yeah. All right, well, there you go, folks. That If you want to see or read the, the workout, the workout schedule, get that book, Building the Classic Physique the Natural Way. Well, thanks for uh, setting everything straight there, Dave. All yeah. right, well, so today I'm here with Dave Dowling, co-author Steve Reeves, his legacy in films. Now... Book update in interview number two. This is interview number three. You and George spilled the beans that you have a book coming out in June. Uh, go ahead. Tell us what's well, going on with that. The second edition of the movie book. And as I, I think I, this book right here, this is going mm -hmm. away. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll be coming out with a book that's probably the size of Classic Physique. Mm -hmm. Okay. It'll have some updates. It'll have a few things, maybe um, massage more, you know, maybe not, not really deleted, but um, we found that the page count in the original book was a little too high because the pictures were too large. So we're going to shrink a bunch of pictures. We're going to add some new pictures and there's going to be some new text throughout it. So um, where does it stand? Oh, I'd say it's 50% done. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Well, when did you start the book, if you don't mind my asking? We're oh, in, uh, what, February right now? Oh, oh well, I, I've been working on the files for quite, a, oh, probably three months. And then oh, George, wow. George gave me, the, well, George and I talked about it last summer, actually. Mm -hmm. So when he talked about it, that's when I started changing some of the files and this and that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I started sending George the files a few months ago. Okay. So, uh, yeah. No, it's going to, you know, I said 50% done. Maybe that's a little stretch, but just the 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 last part, the last 50% is going to take a lot of work. A yes. Lot. And if you've never written a book, there is a ton of work and a ton of unforeseen circumstances that always oh. come into play. So thank you and George, you know, for spearheading that. I can't wait to see it. So, you know, I am seeing a lot of activity on social media. And I, I see that as my role, being the guy who is not only a huge Steve Reese fan, and you know, a lot of the younger kids, teenagers, twenty-something, thirty-something, are really discovering Steve Reeves because I hear from them regularly. They have questions, and I am so happy to see this because. The man was an amazing person. He was about integrity. He was a hard worker. He was a goal setter. He believed in the power of the mind. He was all about healthy and clean living. And, you know, for the drug users that get into steroids, growth hormone, insulin, all that stuff, 
you better watch out because when you get older, you're going to pay the piper. Yeah. And the longer you go living a natural, healthy lifestyle, you're going to reap the rewards when you get older, when you get 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. So understand if you are a young man, young woman, and you are into fitness, time goes fast. Mm -hmm. Right, Dave? Yeah. Dave, yeah. Dave won't even let us talk about numbers when we talk about celebrating his birthday anymore. Oh, I'm 73. <laughs> 73. All right. Well, so just understand that if you are doing this the natural way, it is a race between a rabbit and a turtle and the turtle's going to win. You're going to win. So keep it clean, stay natural, and your quality of life is going to uh, you know, all things considered, be so much better. And most likely you're going to have to go to the doctor a lot less too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, speaking of going to the doctor, you know, Deborah, his partner told me, well, Steve really didn't go to the doctor until he was 70. And, um, you know, in hindsight, I'm sure Steve wishes he went much earlier. So um, we'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah. And I, I remember he, you know, he knew his body inside and out. He was a scientist in so many ways. He knew that if he, when he had an ulcer, uh, I think during uh, a long ride from hell, because mm -hmm. he was doing so many different roles mm -hmm. in that movie. And he used Knox gelatin, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that remedied whatever the ailment was. I think it was an ulcer. A lot of cheese too. He ate. A lot of cheese helped him with that. So that might, I'm just speculating, this is my opinion, that might have been why he didn't go, you know, to the doctor more often is that he felt like he knew. Mm -hmm. But yes, you need to go to the doctor. If you are a certain age, go go get your physical, you know, and whatever your doctor tells you to do, do that because yeah. that's going to be the safest way. Yeah, no, no, I... I mean, uh, you know, I met Steve in 96 and the last time I saw him was in the end of October 99. And I saw, I saw a difference in his health. I, what was I, that reason that you saw him in October 99? He was appearing at a, a movie memorabilia show in Manhattan. All right. And he was there with Soupy Sales, Gail Storm and Troy Donahue. Did he and, know you were coming or did you just pop well, in? Yeah. He, yeah. And, uh, he, you know, he gave me a big wave, shook my hand. He met my late wife and, you know, she nice. was a guy all over me. She says, boy, he looks great. You know, with a big blue eye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He looks, he looks great in jeans and all the, the whole thing, you know, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story though. Um, I think the, uh, show was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we were there on Sunday afternoon and Steve with a big smile, he said, you know, these other people are here. Friday morning, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning. And he said, I told the promoter, I'll be here, but I want $500 more. The promoter said, no. Steve says, okay, I'll see you in the afternoon. So mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, stick to your guns. Yep. That's another reason that I love the guy is that he yeah. was, um, you know, very insistent on what he wanted. And if yeah. you know, he didn't get it, then goodbye. Yeah. Tough luck. And, and it was nice because he knew my interest was in films. And he would just start talking about his films. He, he mainly talked that day about Duel of the Titans and Gordon Scott, but he just started talking and it was nice. You know, I just kind of, I just sat back and listened, was <laughs> absorbing it all, you know, but it, it was nice. So, that shows, you know, a high, to me, it shows perhaps a high EQ emotional quotient where he understands his audience, you, mm -hmm. and he understands that you're more into the film. So rather than talking about training or horses or what have you, He's right. talking about something that he knows about that he also knows you're interested in. Right. So wonderful. Right. right. No, it, it was nice. It was nice. Very nice of him. All right. So, Dave, I'm sharing a screenshot from my YouTube community. And this is the video Steve Reeves exclusive interview by Pat Henry and Tony Quinn. And um, I think this video is getting around. It's got about 200,000 views now. And I think it was. I don't know if it was two years ago or one year ago, but anyway, I love the comment that this person left. This person says, and this comments right below the video on my YouTube page. I don't think people realize the significance of this interview. You look at all the massive fitness, bodybuilding magazines, shows, and now podcasts in circulation. They generate a fortune in sales, viewers, and downloads. 
yet would never in a million years get close to having this man talking about Steve Reeves, this man's time either back then or today, if he was still here. And I have no doubt most of them tried to no avail to interview Steve. Pat and Tony pulled off the impossible by just being themselves and Steve recognized that right away. And so my comment was, you're absolutely right. Fake news and clickbait, clickbait rule the airwaves. Integrity and being a man of value are way more important. And at the end of our life, you'll be proud for doing it the right way. Cheers to Pat and Tony. And if you haven't seen that interview, it is a casual laid back interview in which Steve was in London. And from what I understand, uh, Pat, Henry and Tony had met. Well, I know this to be true because I saw the video that GMV uh, bodybuilding videos. That's Wayne Galosh sells. And I see in the video. Uh, Pat and Tony getting Steve's autograph. And at some time, at some point they asked Steve for an interview. They, and, and Steve showed up at their door and that's the interview that this person left a comment mm -hmm. on. And I love that. And it's so true. Okay. Right. So if you're, yeah. you know, you can go to my YouTube channel, Steve Reeves Hercules, and you'll see that video that we're talking about with Pat Henry and Tony Quinn front and center. In the description, it'll tell you all that information. If you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful video. I, I still watch bits and pieces of mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. you're hearing from Steve's mouth. Right, right. Well, you know, he, he obviously liked those two guys. And when Steve liked somebody, you know, he didn't feel pressure or anything like that. And Steve had often complained that some of his uh some of the print articles on him, he was misquoted and he didn't like that. So I could see him, I'm going to do a video and you'll hear it right from my mouth. You know, this is the way it is. Absolutely. But I, I could see that. So. All right, well, let's move on. So we are going to talk about uh, how Steve uh, turned down some movie roles and what his thoughts on those movie roles might have been after he saw what happened with those movies and those actors. So Dave, take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, he turned down quite a few roles. Uh, not real big movies, but I'll, I'll go through a few of them. In 1958, when he was making The White Warrior, he was actually approached by a British company, um, I think Solar Productions, to do a Tarzan film, Tarzan's Greatest Adventure. Now, Gordon Scott had already made a couple but they, they came to Steve and uh, said, hey, would you be interested in it? And he said, no, he wasn't interested in it. He felt Tarzan was a step below the Hercules role. So he, he didn't do that. And then in the following year, he was offered a film called uh, Fear Strikes at Dawn with Zsa Gabor. They both turned that down. And I don't know all the reasons why they turned him down. I don't know if it was the script or the money or whatever. Uh, the, then the following year, 1960, he had the, was offered The Great Flood. And... Um, that was right around the time he's making Morgan the Pirate. Again, he turned that down. I don't know what, I don't think the film was ever made. And the, the next year at 61, he was offered the uh, the founding of the Valiant. And uh, they, they did make the film with John Mills and Steve recommended the actor John Mills. Steve didn't like the role because it, he was 36 at the time and they wanted him to play somebody who was 50. He wasn't interested. Then as, we, as many know, he was offered the role in Dr. No in early 62, might have been the end of 61. And uh, he turned that down, but it just didn't pay. I think it was $50,000 and Steve was making well over probably, you know, 200 at the time. Was that the James Bond movie? Yeah, Dr. No, the first James Bond film. So a question on that, you see some pictures out there on social media, Facebook, whatever, and there's a picture of Steve holding a gun and he looks almost like a James Bond character. Uh, do you know anything about, have, no. first of all, have you seen the picture? And if so, do you know anything about what was the, the background of it? No, I haven't seen the picture and I okay. don't know anything about it. I'll have to look for that one. So. I'll send it to you after we're done. Okay. We'll talk about it next time or something. <laughs> all right. And then there was another film um, based on Victor Hugo's book, Toilers of the Sea. Uh, he didn't like, uh, he just didn't like the script. He didn't like the story of it. 
And then in 64, as many know, uh, Joseph E. Levine approached him to do a pilot for a Hercules TV show. And uh, he turned that down. Um, he wanted to get out of the Hercules role and it, the role went to Gordon Scott. And then it never made it as a pilot. It never got to the networks. And then it was released as Hercules and the Princess of Troy. So, and that's out on video. And then as many know in 65, uh, he was researching um, a bullfighting film based on the famous uh, Spanish bullfighter, Angel Peralta. Mm -hmm. and he did a lot of training, a lot of study, a lot of work and everything. And then the producers backed out. They thought maybe it'd be too violent for the American audiences. Mm. So, and then uh, the same year in 65, he turned down One Million Years BC, the lead in that. Raquel Welch. <laughs> he didn't know Raquel was in the, <laughs> in the film at the time. I'm only kidding. But anyway, uh, I mean, that made her a star. It was, you know, it wasn't a bad film. The special effects were great. But uh, Steve, I don't think he was too crazy about doing caveman speech. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the money wasn't there either. The, yeah. 50,000. And then, um, well, right around that time, um, as many know, well, actually, it was a little bit earlier. It was either the end of 63 or early 64, he was offered the lead role in Fistful of Dollars. And uh, actually, the, the original title was The Magnificent Stranger. And it was based on a girl, uh, what's his name? I can't remember the Japanese director. Um, his um, samurai film mm -hmm. from uh, 1961. Mm -hmm. called Yojimbo. And Steve, he, you know, he had, he had talks with the director, Sergio Leone, and Steve mm -hmm. said, wait a minute. He says, I can't see an Italian director <laughs> directing a Western based on a Japanese samurai film. So on and on and on. So it, it didn't get much beyond that. And uh, Leone was disappointed. But I think if I got down to actually salary, because the total budget of that film was around 200,000, maybe 225 at the most. So Steve's making a salary higher than the whole budget of the film. And I, I think if it got down to that, I think Steve would have turned it down. But as we know, what, you know, what it did for Clint Eastwood's career, Steve said, gee, you know, I could have had that, but Clint Eastwood was perfect in the part, just like Rocky's perfect. In, in the, or Stallone is perfect in the Rocky films and Gordon was good in Tarzan and so on and so forth. So they got the right person for it. But, um, you know, there's this book out there um, by Sir Christopher Frayling. Let's see if I can, can you see that there? Yes, perfect. Yeah, something to do with death. Mm -hmm. And he, it's all about Sergio Leone. That is a huge book, my a, gosh. <laughs> Uh, it's quite a few pages, but there's a there's a whole section on fistful of dollars, and it's almost fifty pages. But he he t he only mentions Steve's name once in there. He mainly focuses on the history of the film, but he also talks about other actors who are offered the part. And there's you know seven or eight other actors. Originally, they they thought about Henry Fonda, mm -hmm. and Henry Fonda's agent wouldn't even give him the script because the the film was being stereotyped as a B film, maybe even a C film. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, wanted, they talked about Cliff Robertson. Then they talked about Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson, actually, he didn't like the script. And it's, it's so ironic that a few years after this, both Bronson and Fonda were in Once Upon a Time in the West, mm -hmm. Sergio Leone's you know, classic Western. And then there was uh, Ty Harden. There was uh, Eric Fleming. Uh, a, a Canadian actor, Rod Cameron. Uh, let's see if there's anybody. There are probably a few other people. Oh, uh, Henry Silva. I don't know if you know Henry Silva. He mm -hmm. was in uh, Ocean's Eleven. Okay. But the the person who, um, and I mentioned this in the last interview, the person who Leone really chased down was actor Richard Harrison. And Richard Harrison, um, he wasn't interested, and I think his price is a little bit too high anyway, but he used to follow, Leone used to follow um, Richard Harrison around from set to set. And the other reason why Harrison was being considered is because Harrison just got done 
with one of the first spaghetti westerns, Gunfight at um, Red, Red Sands. And the producers of that film were the producers of Fistful of Dynamite. So they were really interested in getting Richard Harrison on board. And Richard Harrison, he, he wasn't interested. And that's when he recommended Clint Eastwood for the part. And Clint Eastwood's salary, believe it or not, was only 15000 for that. And what had Clint done prior to that? Do you know? He was still, he's in the seventh season of Rawhide. Okay. And he did the movie on like a, his break. Yeah. Over the, I think it was April to May, that's in 64. That's when mm -hmm. the film was made. And it came out in Italy in September of 64, and it wasn't a big hit. So they pulled the film, they re-edited it. Uh, Ennio Morricone, he added more music to it. They, they cleaned it up and then they brought it back to the theaters and that's when it took off. But it didn't get to the U.S. until January of 67 mm -hmm. because the director of Yojimbo, Akura, had a copyright problem with Leone's screenplay. It was mm. almost scene for scene. Whereas uh, when they did the, um, uh, the 1960 uh, uh, Magnificent Seven, Mm -hmm. John Sturgis was a director. He based that on a 1954 samurai film. And there wasn't any problem there. And I think Leone thought, oh, well, I could do the same. But his was so close, the screenplay. And so anyway, uh, the film finally got cleared up in the copyright area. And it came to the U.S. in January 67. But by that time, Eastwood had already made a couple more films for mm -hmm. Leone. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the, ball was, the ball was rolling at that point. Right. For it's, it, it, it kind of paralleled Steve's career. Yeah, when, right. When Hercules came here, Steve had like five films, six films under his belt. So do you know, uh, Dave, if Steve and Clint ever met in person? I don't know that for a fact, but I think they did. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, Steve was very quiet about some things, and every so often, you know, like... Do you know when they came out with uh, Disney came out with uh, the animated Hercules mm -hmm. film? I think it was in '97. Well, Steve had lunch with the CEO at the time, Michael Eisner, mm -hmm. and he just happened to tell George Helmer, "Oh yeah, I had lunch with Michael Eisner." He was. He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I went out and checked yeah. the mail today. I went out and watered <laughs> the lawn, and I had lunch with Michael Eisner. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, Steve, he had a lot of information, and every so often he just talk about it, you know. But I wouldn't be surprised if the two of them met because, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone, he had met Steve, and he always wanted to make some kind of film with Steve. And then also at the in the 90s, that remember Kevin Sorbo's Hercules? Oh, yeah, movie? sure. Well, George Helmer actually in 96 showed me a script. They wanted Steve for an episode down there. And yeah, I read it, I said, oh, it looks pretty good. It was just, wasn't a uh, major part. Mm -hmm. It was more than a cameo, and he, Steve was going to play a king. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, Steve told George, "Hey, George, look into this because I've never been to New Zealand before." Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a big factor for Steve as to where he might get to travel. Yeah, it was. It was to travel, but but it never never happened. It never happened. I don't know why. So a question about Sylvester Stallone and Rocky. Rocky came out in what, 1977, 76? I think 76, yeah. Yep. Do, do you think that it was such a huge movie that year? And I remember going to the movie theater, whether it was 76 or 77, when I actually saw it. Uh, do you know when Steve might have seen that movie? Would he have seen it within the first year due to the buzz and all that? Do you think? What's, and, and I know this is just your opinion. My opinion is he saw it that, that year it came out. Right? And that was 76? 76. It's, it's just like, remember when uh, Russell Crowe's Gladiator came out? Yeah, in uh, May of 2000. And Steve was looking forward to seeing that. And oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, he didn't make it. I think it opened the day Steve passed away. That's what the word is, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. No, no he, he was looking forward to seeing that, you know? So, but... And, and then um, another question. So when Steve was turning down these movies, his wife was very involved with oh. Steve's affairs. Do you think that that also played a role in him accepting or turning down movies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think the money was at this point in his life, the money was maybe the biggest factor or was it something else? 
at this point in his life, uh, it, it was a, a pretty good factor. It may not have been the only fact, but no, it, yeah, it was up there. It was up there. Because yeah. he had already done so many movies, what, 14, yeah. 15, something like that. And he talked yeah. about wanting to retire because of Errol Flynn and, you know, the other person who died young. And he wanted to retire by, what, age 40, I believe? The, no, uh, yeah, he retired his last film when he was 42. But, but Steve considered coming out of retirement, though, around 74. Uh, he wanted the role in the Doc Savage film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were, I don't know how many books written on Doc Savage, a couple hundred. There's, it sold 20 million copies. And Steve actually met with the producer, George Powell. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they revised the script because there was a writer's strike at the time. And George Powell took up the, the screenplay and this and that. And Steve and the director, they didn't, they didn't like some of these changes and so on and so forth. But Steve's, um, I heard this um, years later from Steve's official biographer, Milton Moore, he talked to George Powell and George Powell said, you know, after talking to Steve, I wasn't that crazy about his voice. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have been the, the right person for the role. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of that. And uh, the script was, you know, in Bedlam and stuff like that. So, but mm -hmm. no, he considered coming out of retirement. So, but no, Steve, um, you know, even a giant, a marathon, I may have mentioned last time where, that his co-star, we call her Mylene, it's Milan or whatever. And she was saying, even back then, Steve was sa saving all his money because his focus was on having a ranch mm -hmm. and horses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and and Steve told me in 99 at that movie memorabilia thing in New York City, he said, he was talking about Gordon Scott and Gordon Scott was not fin financially well off like Steve at all. Mm -hmm. Why? And, why do you think that was? And I know you're just speculating. Well, uh, I, I, Gordon was married several times. Okay. And he had children, and so he was in a different situation than Steve. Right. Right. But he also had big spending habits. Steve said when he was in Europe, he had the best of everything. You know, mm -hmm. he had a couple of Norton motorcycles, a Maserati, and all this. And Steve told me, he said, "I told Gordon, Gordon, save your money, mm -hmm. save your money." Mm -hmm. And he said, if he did, he'd be enjoying the good life like I am today. Right. So, but m money was a priority with Steve. But Steve was also generous, too. I mean, I, I've heard stories where from George Helmer where people would borrow money from Steve and then they'd go to give it back. And he'd say, no, 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 give it to so-and-so. Give it to uh, so, so So question on, on that. Are we talking family members? Are we talking neighbors? Are we talking people in the acting world? Uh, do you have any well, idea? And if you don't want to say, oh, you don't have to. I know one of them was Gordon Scott. I know oh, okay. Gordon Scott. Yeah. Yeah. So, Interesting. But, so what do you think Steve would have thought of all the Westerns that uh, there's a director whose name I can't remember. I bet you'll know who he is. He's very popular right now. And it seems like he puts out another Western type series every time you turn around. Uh, Kevin Costner is in, you know, one of the series, and it's I think it's in Montana, the setting. Uh, you you mean Yellow, Yellowstone? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yes, thank yeah. you. Who, who is the director? Do you, do you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the director has a ranch in Texas, uh, and he may have more than one ranch, but he owns like 200,000 acres, and the director, he films – you know, all of his movies on his land. And mm. I just wonder how, and, and my wife and I enjoy watching his, his shows, including Yellowstone, especially the earlier when Yellowstone was brand new. I just wonder how Steve would have, would have liked those current Westerns. Uh, can you uh, pitch oh, in I, on any of that? Oh, I, I, I think Steve loved all kinds of Westerns. And, and actually in the sixties, when he was living back in the U S he approached some of the networks. He, about possibly a TV Western show. Mm -hmm. But toward, you know, the end of the 60s, the saturation of Westerns was, was dying out. And they yeah. were going, they're going to a different genre. Yeah. So he was, he was a little bit late on that. But no, I think he always had an interest in the Western. And I think he'd appreciate those today. It, it's funny that you mentioned that. One of the other reasons why, you know, Steve didn't like the, some of the things in Fistful, and he, he thought it was too violent. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, when Steve's Long Ride from Hell came out, that was rated R. 
Mm -hmm. I remember one of the wow films, <laughs> today it'd be rated G. <laughs> <laughs> it was rated R. I, I, I've seen the trailer and it's got a big R. And, uh, you know, there's a torture scene in there and stuff. But I mean, compared to today, it would never yeah. be rated R. Right. But, um, no, there were, one of the film critics, Judith Christ, I think she worked for the, the Daily New, New York Daily News. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But she said, rate this one V for violent. Mm. So, yeah, I saw something recently. I made a post actually where they were they the media was were, were blaming Steve for violence, escalating violence in movies due to Hercules and you know movies early on in his career, and it's pretty laughable now. It is. It is. It is. Uh, it the is. director's name is Taylor Sheridan of Yellowstone. Oh, That's who I was oh. trying to think of. So okay. just to close the book on that. The wealth of information that you have, Dave, is incredible. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I mean, that's, I guess it's like me. I'm not saying my information is incredible, but I know a lot about bodybuilding and, and to hear you just reel this stuff off is very impressive. So thank you for sharing all this with us. Oh, it's, that's okay. It's, it's fine. I, I, it's, it's very important, you know, to get this on uh, video. Uh, so once again, just like we talked about the Steve Reeves interview that 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years from now, people who are interested in Steve, and you can actually hear this, you know, from your mouth. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Oh, it's, oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Now I'm trying to think if there's any other footnotes uh, about that. But uh, no, uh, you know, Richard Harrison was telling me um, the word on the street about Fistful was, you know, it's it's going to be in the drive-ins. It's 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 a nothing film because everybody knew about the budget, mm -hmm. being two hundred or two hundred twenty-five thousand. Mm. They didn't. Ex they didn't expect anything out of it. But yeah, they. Because Sergio Leone, the director, really wasn't known that well at the time. He only right. he did Colossus of Rhodes in '61. Prior mm. to this, so he didn't have much of a resume. He was mainly a second unit director. And he and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't have the greatest uh, relationship. No, no. And uh, not only Steve and Sergio, but Clint Eastwood and Sergio, because. Richard Harrison said he took them, the two of them, to, well, the three of them were at lunch. And he said, I could tell immediately that Clint didn't like Sergio and vice versa. Mm. But uh, now they, but they got, they got through it. And, you know, Steve didn't have a good relationship with Sergio on Last Days of Pompeii. Mm -hmm. Sergio is credited with directing probably three quarters of that film. Mm -hmm. And in some of the movie posters later on, it just says directed by Sergio Leone. And the other thing about these Westerns, these Italian Westerns, was that when they came out in Italy, they wanted to have the Italian audience or the European audience think of it as like an American Western because they changed their names. Mm -hmm. Like Sergio Leone was Bob Robertson, and the villain in there, uh, Gian Maria Volante, was Johnny Wells, mm -hmm. and um, Benito Stefalini, who was in Steve's four or five films, he changed his name to... Benny Reeves <laughs> in honor of Steve. Mm. So th they did that in the credits. And uh, Ennio Morricone, the uh, music composer, he changed his name to Dan Savio. <laughs> so you can see so, the original posters and you see those names, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. So, what are your thoughts? And I, I know you're just speculating, but you knew Steve. Uh, when he saw the movie, Steve, I'm assuming that he saw it in the movie theater. You couldn't go to Blockbuster at that time and, and, and rent the uh, video. So at some point, Steve obviously saw A Fistful of Dollars. Did he ever talk to you about that? Or if not, what do you think his take on it was? Do you think he would have enjoyed that movie? Um, he didn't talk to me directly about it. Um, there was some conversation... I overheard or something like that. He still thought Fistful was a little too violent. He, he did say that. He did think it was well-directed though. And I think that's what caught a lot of people's eye that, hey, this guy knows how to make a film, Sergio Leone. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, no, uh, the photography was good and everything, but I think Steve thought it was a good Western, but a little over the top as far as the violence. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but, uh, I'm sure he enjoyed Good, Bad, and the Ugly. You know, I know he saw all of them. I know. Do you he think he, you think he saw Dirty Harry and and those? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. Do. Right. Yeah. He, you know, he he left film too. Not only because 
you know, he, he wanted to retire early and avoids, you know, whatever happened to Errol Flynn and um, uh, who's the other actor? Um, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> okay. I'm sure as soon as we hang up here, we'll yeah, remember. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Er, the er, audience is like, it's, you know, we know who it is. Come okay. on. Cut this part out. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Steve, Steve didn't, he, he didn't want to repeat what other, what happened to other actors who, oh, Tyrone Power. Right. Who, who left so early. Right. And so his, his goal was, look, I got to have enough money. I got to get my ranch and my horses. I want to retire. I want to do something else. And, uh, and he, and he met, he met his goal. He met his yeah. goal. So, um, but again, you know, he, he kept an open mind, as I said earlier, you know, he, he entertained going back into a few select films, but he noticed too, like everybody, the violence and the sex picked up, you know, in the seventies and eighties and stuff. And he's just as well. I'm not involved in that. Right. So, you know, but, if I remember correctly, uh, I could be wrong, correct my memory, but he enjoyed watching Lawrence Welk later mm -hmm. on. He enjoyed uh, the medicine, Quinn, the medicine woman TV show. Oh, yeah. Um, that was, uh, was that Jane Seymour? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, do you know any other shows that he maybe liked uh, later on, TV shows or movies? Like, you know, in the I, I, know I know he enjoyed musicals. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. He, he was disappointed with when he made Athena. He thought that was going to be another Seven Brides or Seven Brothers, mm -hmm. and he was disappointed. It didn't do that well at the box office. But yeah. oh, he, he enjoyed music a lot, a lot, you know. So, but no, and you know, he didn't have uh, he didn't have many uh, channels or many stations on his TV because that's I, true. <laughs> I remember talking to Deborah. I said, "Oh." Uh, Hercules, they're showing Hercules uh, next week on AMC, mm -hmm. you know, American Movie Classics. And she said, we don't get it here. <laughs> <laughs> we get CBS, ABC, and yeah. NBC. Yeah, yeah, no, so. Yeah, that's it. But, uh, no. And, you know, they, they also did, uh, you've heard of the Hercules Recycled. They, they yeah. One and Hercules one and two, and they put it together. And I haven't seen that yet, uh, but I'll at some point I will see it if it's still available somewhere. Yeah, they um, Steve saw it and uh, he wasn't impressed. They made it kind of a comedy, I guess, and uh, they changed the character's name. I forget what they called him. He was some from the galaxy or something. But I think Steve got thirty thousand for that. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and speaking, of, you know, Steve got some nice world royalties from a company called Adami in Europe. They kept track of all all the many times that his films are on TV, French TV or Italian TV, and there was a royalty involved, and they sent it to the actor. And I, I, out of the blue, I got a, I a phone call or email in the 90s. They wanted to know where Gordon Scott was, and I just happened to know he was living in Cottonwood, Arizona. They said, because we have a royalty check for him. No, oh, good. Yeah. So, uh, and then I, I talked to Gordon after Steve passed away. And Gordon said, oh, it wasn't that long ago. I got a nice check for 35000 from overseas. And I almost said, you can thank me for that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's cool. Yeah. But he made, Gordon made a lot of films over there. So, yeah, you know, I, I wasn't surprised at the amount. So what happens uh, with Gordon Scott? He what year did he pass away? Do you know? Two thousand seven. So what happens to those uh, checks when when he's uh, no longer alive? Do you have any idea? Uh, Is it? I I I don't know. It all depends on if if he had an attorney. Yeah. Know, ben, yeah, you, you could know. see where that would be fairly important. You know, to to be uh, able to I look. Think Right, they have to be a beneficiary. I would, yeah, I would, think, so. Be a beneficiary. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, right. no. So, but, all right. Well, right. Any, what else did you want to mention? You have covered a lot. It has been fantastic. I could listen to you talk forever. <laughs> I should have studied this hard in college. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, um, I you know, I always thank George Helmer, and, and I should thank George Helmer because right, we're together today because of George Helmer and right. You know, it was so nice of George to take me on board when, you know, he started publishing um, the newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. This mm -hmm. one's this one's autographed. That's mm -hmm. autographed. Okay. And you can find some of those on uh, yeah. eBay from yeah. time to time. I have some of those too. Those are wonderful. Very well done. He graduated into the um, 
like the classic physique magazine. And you helped contribute and edit some yeah. of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. And I, I really appreciate that. That's how I got involved in the writing of it. I'd write different things, and mainly about the movies and stuff. But what I did like about it at the times, you know, Steve was alive. Steve looked at every word. And he would, you know, he'd tweak them. He would mm -hmm. tweak them, and then he'd get back to us and say, no, no, this is, this is what you want to say. This is what you want to say. Mm -hmm. So these, these things that came out, they're authorized by Steve. Well, you know, there was only a few more that came out after Steve passed away. But um, I think there, there's a real um, movement right now, and it may be a little smallish, but I feel like it's getting more and more traction where the younger generation is really interested you know, in physical culture from the 40s, the 50s, and even the early 1900s with G Eugene Sandow and George Hackenschmidt. Um, so, you know, if they can find those newsletters, those magazines, I don't know if George is still selling them or if he's ever thought about doing digital copies, but I bet you they would be well received, you know, over, well, over yeah. time, especially. There are some on his website. I know that. He, he's okay, good. Put it on to the website so you can see him. Because that's where the gold is, audience, you know, is today, you know, once again, um, there's a lot of clickbait and uh, there's a lot of glossing over information and buzzwords. The real good information comes from, you know, that time period, the early 1900s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So I would be looking there if you're looking for, you know, really good training methods, nutrition, all of that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Plus, plus Steve's book, Classic Physique, right? Right, it's right. All there. Yeah, it's all there. But yeah, so, but I, I'll never forget when I saw this. This is the uh, nineteen eighty three muscle. Eighty three. I mean, up until I saw this, I always wondered what happened to Steve. Yeah. And then I saw his picture. So you were a technical writer at that point in your life, 1983, yeah. and how did you come upon that magazine at the gro you saw it at the grocery at the store? The grocery or? store, and I said to my late wife, that must have been one of those moments, yeah. lightning bolt moments. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was. A, I said to my late wife, I said, "Oh, look, there's Steve Reeves on the cover." And she said, "Who?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, I I grabbed it, and I, I I don't know how many times I read through. It's a fantastic article they have in there. It is. Great uh, pictures in there. Yeah. It, Lou Ferrigno that, in there. That's a great a oh, yeah. great issue. It's a great issue. And um, that's when Steve was introducing power walking. Mm -hmm. You could get the weights directly from him. And mm -hmm. oh, that's that's a classic, classic issue. It's just it a really is. Issue. So he was what, 50, 90, uh, 83. He was uh, 51. No, six. Help me out. So he's born in 26. Yeah. And that issue came out in 83. He's 57. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, but the pictures and stuff on the ranch, they were taken in 82. Okay. Okay. And with, Joe Weeder was there. And what, what's interesting is that there's a, a picture with a cat on Joe's shoulder and you see Steve, you know, looking up at Joe pointing at it, but then there's another picture where they remove the cat. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So they were using Photoshop and stuff even, you know, even then. Even back then. But I remember at Steve's funeral, um, after the service that was in Escondido, I think May 6th or something, it was a Saturday. And, uh, you know, Joe Weeder was there, Lou Ferrigno was there, and Bob Kennedy. And Jack LaLanne, I guess. No, Jack, he was invited. He, wasn't. he couldn't make it. Bo Derek couldn't make it. Sly Stallone couldn't make it. Gordon Scott couldn't make it. But uh, it was well represented by the fitness community. And um, one of Steve's friends, um, he lives in Rhode Island now, but he was living in Florida at the, uh, when Steve met him, Bob Panarello. And Bob had no problem speaking to anybody. He went up to Joe Weeder and says, you got to get Steve on the cover of the next issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Joe Weeder said, no problem. No problem. Well, mm -hmm. he wasn't, he wasn't on the cover. There was an article, you know, about his passing and stuff, a nice article. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I do remember that. And it, it never happened. But. I know that uh, people asked Ben Weeder uh, who the best bodybuilder ever was. And without hesitating, Ben Weeder said Steve Reeves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, you know, not that long ago. It wasn't in like the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. 
And speaking of Bo Derek, I had an interaction with Bo Derek, and you have to understand when I saw the movie Ten, I was a teenager, so you know hormones and all that stuff. <laughs> and so I have that uh, hyperextension knee raise apparatus that Steve made yeah. with the pictures of Steve and Bo Derek. I guess John Derek, I'm guessing, must have taken that picture. Uh, anyway, so I I posted that picture on Instagram and tagged Bo Derek. And I'll be doggone if she didn't see it and thanked me and said, I haven't seen that picture in forever. Really? And of course, my, my heart went pitter patter, you know, really? and um, I tried to get more info from her, but I never heard back. But anyway, that was a wonderful moment. And that was because of social media. So there's social there media. you go. There's the power of social media. Yeah, that, oh, that's interesting. That's a good story. That's a good story. Wow. Well, yeah, we they. They tried calling her. We were at Steve's ranch, and Steve had a little black book with <laughs> all these phone numbers, and there were quite, <laughs> quite a few famous people in there. I wasn't in there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we went down the list, and, and we, we couldn't get a hold of a few people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But, no, they're all unlisted numbers, and so, you know, Steve had them, and, you know, so, but, uh No. It was a good turnout, though. I, I don't know, maybe 75, 100 people attended wow. the service in this chapel. Yeah. Then we went to the Lar Lawrence Welk Center mm -hmm. in Dino for a reception. It was a beautiful reception. It was lovely. Yeah. Mm. And I've yeah. seen pictures of it, and yeah, it looks amazing. And, and that's where I talked to Richard Harrison. I was talking to him about the films and stuff. And ah. I'm, I'm repeating myself from one of the earlier videos, but that's when he said he wanted that part in Duel of Titan so badly. Mm -hmm. but as well, Steve gave it to his friend Gordon Scott. Yeah. Well, speaking of repeating yourself, you know, I'll do videos on YouTube or social media posts. And, you know, um, Joe Vitale told me when you advertise, you have to constantly, you know, get in front of your audience, whether it's a story that you have to tell three, two, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty 10, 20 times. Mm -hmm. You know, Coca Cola, they don't need to advertise, but you're always seeing Coca Cola, whether it's in a magazine or digitally online or a TV mm -hmm. commercial. Watch the Super Bowl coming up. There may be, you know, commercials for Coke or, you know, everyday brands that we already know about. So it's just a reminder to me. Even though I think people already know about The Wall, the holy grail of bodybuilding, mm -hmm. they already know about Steve's Jag because I've made more than one videos on it. People come in every day onto my YouTube channel, social media, and they're just discovering this. So I, you know, keep repeating yourself because I'm telling you, there'll be a new audience that's not, <laughs> has not heard what you've said in interview number one or interview number two. Okay, well, okay, good. I feel comfortable then. <laughs> you're you're like a parade when you're advertising. You have to constantly, you know, because people are in a trance for the most part. They're not really paying attention. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with repeating yourself. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> in uh, Deborah's book. Yes, I uh, read it. You, this one. Let's see. Yes, I've read it. I was just looking through it the other day. Um, and I'm very grateful that she wrote it because even yeah. though I know that is a a uh, controversial book in some ways. She's giving us more information about a man that, you know, we didn't know. Right. 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 So I, I really appreciate it. I don't have anything bad to say about it whatsoever. I, I didn't know that Steve didn't see all his own films until they came out. On You're right. Yeah. She talks about that in the book. I, I didn't know that. And I remember George Helmer telling me that he was bringing some VHS tapes down to Steve's house. I said, why? He says, well, he's never seen the film. I said, what? He says, yeah. He says, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. But now he's curious. Now he's curious. Well, but you know, in the time he was making all these movies back to back, right? So do you think maybe he was just so busy with it or he no. genuinely really didn't care? Well, you know what? He probably saw the, what they call the dailies or the rushes. And okay. maybe that was enough for him. He saw yeah. on, on the screen. So, oh, okay, that's how I look. That's how I sound. And right. Maybe, maybe that was enough. So I'll move on. Right. But um, anyway, she uh, she talks about their spiritual wedding in there. Right. And, I remember that. Uh, you know, in, in the classic physique book, both editions, Steve dedicates it to his wife, Deborah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in her, um, uh, she has another book out somewhere in Valley Center. I don't know if you're, I have a copy of that too. It's I don't just, know about the second book. It's a, it's a scrapbook uh, mm -hmm. of a, uh, a lot of stuff that went on Valley Center. And 
Steve's mentioned a few times, but she's she has a resume in there, a written resume, and she says I was the unofficial wife of Steve Reeves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever. But anyway, what I'm getting at is she talks about where they exchange their vows in uh, Wyoming, just mm -hmm. outside of Jackson Hole. And they mm -hmm. have this, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cute little chapel with the te Grand Tetons in the background. Well, I mm -hmm. took a trip last May mm -hmm. and I saw I saw that and I didn't realize that was the chapel where Steve and Deborah exchanged their spiritual. Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't realize it. I was looking at her book a few months ago. I said, oh, my God. I, I, yeah. I realized that when I was there. But anyway, that no, I so, was there. That's fascinating. And, and that jars my memory because I was just leafing through this book, Deborah's book, and she actually met Steve when she was like 21 the first time. Yeah. You remember that? And yeah. then I don't know. I think was she in her 40s or something when they well, ended up. I've, actually, she's a, I think she's the same age as I am. Well, okay. she will be. And I think her birthday's in June. So she's 72 now. OK. And uh, so, yeah, she. Uh, well, she met him oh, what, in 93, maybe 93, was it? I'm not sure. I think 93 or 94 she met But him. prior to that, in the book she wrote, she says that she actually met him the first time when she was like 21 years old. Steve had come by and was looking for ranch hands or something. He, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, yeah and, and then she would see him power walking or riding his horse, and he would just grunt at her. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, update on Deborah, if you have any info, I hope that she's out there doing well. I mean, do you know, I guess she still lives in California. No, she lives in Ecuador. Oh, OK. Yeah. I, I hear from her. Uh, I'm on her just email distribution. OK. And I hear from her from time to time. Good. Um, and I'll correspond. Good. She's doing OK. Uh, Wonderful. She remarried. She married a doctor. Good for her. She likes the Ecuadorian way of life. Good. She's been there quite a few years, actually. Okay, I didn't know that. That's good to yeah, know. No, she actually, uh, probably five years ago, my phone rang and it was Deborah. She was in Ecuador. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm going away talking. And I said, oh, wait a minute. This is this is costing you a lot. Said, <laughs> I said, I'll hang up. <laughs> well, that was nice of her to reach out and stay in touch with you. So we just wish her the best. And Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. No, she was always good, good to know. She was always good to me. So, uh, yep. So. All right. Should we wrap it up? Yeah, yeah. This okay. has been a blast. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dave, for joining us. This is interview number three, and uh, we'll have another. I'm going to find that James Bond-looking picture that I yeah. saw that I thought might have been, you know, Steve, like, doing something for James Bond. I have no idea. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what your take is on that photo, and I'm sure we'll find a lot more to talk about. So thank you for joining us, Dave. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We thank really appreciate you. it. And uh, we'll get back together. And I want to hear more about the book and all that good stuff. Very good. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.